Hello, uh, my name is Alistair Hamill. I'm the Head of Geography at Learning College and welcome along to this little introductory video for our STEM based remote sensing project. My aim here is to give you a little bit of a sense of what it is that we're proposing uh, so that you have a little bit more of, of an idea of what you're signing up for. But I want to start by taking a look at this image that's on the screen. What do you see here? What are you noticing? Now, it may well be that as you look at this, you think that you're looking at some island here with perhaps a strange or odd shaped cloud on this area. What you may not know, however, is what you're actually looking at is some of the wildfires that ravaged Greece during the summer. And the smoke here is from some of those wildfires. But what you can't see is through the smoke to what is lying underneath. But what if we were to re-image this? What if there's more that we can see than what you've just been able to see here? And what if we can take the same image and visualize it very differently? Now, what can you see? What are you looking at here? Well, you might notice up here towards the north of the image that there's a small red, white, bright yellow area. You might notice here large orange area. This area here, very extensive green. And then there's a blue area here, isn't there? And it seems to be fading out some of the stuff that's underneath. Now, we don't yet know what exactly those colors represent. But what they do tell us is that we can definitely see more with the second image than we were able to with the first one. But what is it that we're seeing? What are those colors telling us about the map? To answer that question, it brings us into the area of remote sensing. Now, remote sensing is basically any data collected about an area where you use a tool that means you don't need to be in physical contact with the area that you're sensing. Now, it can be something from a drone flying over an area, aerial photography, or in this case, uh, what we're going to be looking at in this project is satellite-based remote sensing. This is Sentinel-2, a European Union suite of satellites that travels around the planet, has a, a return rate uh, for any location of about three days or so, and it covers the entire planet during that day. So it's giving us near real-time data and information about what's going on on our planet. And what you can see here in the hint in this graphic is that the imagery that they're collecting, this information that they're pulling up, covers a range of different light sources, which brings us into a little bit of physics. Well, you don't really need to have done much physics to know the old Richard of York gave battle in vain, which is the colors of the rainbow. But if you do know physics, you will know that the visible spectrum of light is only a very small proportion of the full electromagnetic spectrum of light. We, as human beings, can only see a tiny bit of the light that's being reflected by the surfaces all around us. So let's come back to those satellite images that we looked at. This is a visual, a visible light image from Sentinel. It's showing what you would see if you looked out the window of, say, the International Space Station, if you were lucky enough to be flying over it. But once you go into the short wave infrared image, once you go beyond the visual and uh, visible spectrum of light, you can visualize things in a very, very different way. And this is showing what those colors represent. It is, if you like, giving us super vision, x-ray vision. We can see more through this than we would be able to see with our eyes. Why is that? How does it work? So I'm going to pose a question to you. Why is it that broccoli is green? So if you know anything much about um, the biology of plants and vegetation and a little bit of the physics of the M spectrum of light, you will know that um, the light that, that hits this vegetation, the vast majority of the red wavelengths of light are being absorbed and the vast majority of the blue are being um, absorbed as well. And you're getting then this reflection of the light uh, and, and early along the green spectrum in particular. And it's that reflection of the light that appears to make the broccoli seem green to us. However, once you go beyond the visible light into those other wavelengths of light from the EM spectrum, we discover actually that the vast majority of light reflected by broccoli is not in the visible range at all, but is in this near infrared range. Large amounts are being 
reflected there. And as you move into the short wave infrared, you're getting different amounts being reflected there as well. And that means that if we switch our camera view to look at those wavelengths of light, we can see things differently. We can see more than would have otherwise been visible to us just with our eyes. So a little bit of biology for you here. What is it that is producing that very high amounts of reflectivity in the near infrared? It's the good old spongy mesophyll. Always a very satisfying term to say, I find. And whenever you come over here into the short wave infrared, you're beginning to see that you can find out about the amount of water that a plant has based on this EM spectrum. Water is one of the things that will determine how healthy a plant is. So a healthy plant will reflect differently than a water-starved, unhealthy plant. We will see things differently and therefore we can image vegetation health across the planet using this remote sensing in near real time. But let's bring it a little bit closer to home to something that happened in April in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm sure you saw the images here of the gorse fire uh, that spread across the Mourne Mountains. And these fires, it was believed, were started deliberately. And the, the images were genuinely very scary. And it took the emergency services uh, some very difficult and brutal work to get up into those mountains and, and stop it from spreading too far. But we can go in uh, and take a look at what Sentinel-2 saw of that. So if I just orientate you quickly, here is Newcastle up here. And we come through here to Silent Valley and this is Sleeve Donard. Now this is the visible spectrum of light. I wonder, can you see where the area was that was damaged? It's actually quite hard to pick out because the Mourne Mountains aren't covered in grass. It's the, the gorse and the heather, which means that they tend to have a, a less green hue anyway. Especially this time of year, they get a little bit greener in the middle of the summer months. But it's a bit hard to see in this visible spectrum of light. What, however, if we shift over here into the near infrared, the vegetation here, the healthy vegetation, is going to reflect an awful lot more via the spongy mesophyll in this near infrared. What's it going to look like? Let's move on. And all of a sudden, wow, it stands out. Now, the way this is imaged, the red is the healthy vegetation. The deeper the red, um, the more light is, uh, or the brighter the red, the more light is being reflected. So you can see here a uh, Donard Wood. You can see the farmland along the coastal strip, and then you can see up into the mountains themselves. But look, lo and behold, there is the place that has been burned. Now that dark bit there is the shadow of the cloud, but you can see where the area has been burned there. But what if we move from the near infrared into the short wave uh, infrared? In actual fact, it stands out even more. The green is the vegetation here, but you can see the area that has been burned stands out tremendously well in this image. Now, in somewhere like the Mourns, whenever there's high population density in nearby where people can photograph this and get there easily, you, you may be wondering what this adds. Um, but think for yourself of um, somewhere like Siberia, very, very remote, massive wildfires in Siberia during this, uh, this past summer. And yet it's extremely remote, very, very low population density, very hard to get there to see what's going on. And yet we have this suite of satellites that's traveling around these, um, these places with a return rate of every two to three days, something like that, which means that in near real time, we can go to highly inaccessible places and find out what's going on. It's a very, very powerful tool. We can do it in near real time, but we can also do it over time. I wonder if we were to come back um, a couple of months later, because it does look like it's devastating here in Sleep Donard. How much damage was there in a couple of months time? What if I were to show you an image from the end of August, just a week or two ago? Well, you can see remarkably how much recovery that vegetation has made. Now, our biologists could help explain why. Could help explain why the gorses that are found there and the heathers, why they're adapted to uh, burning and why they can survive. But again, what we need to do is to, to draw from each other's expertise here from this to understand this better. One final thing that I want to say to you about the uh, EM spectrum of light. Um, different people have different signatures. There's the Queen's signature and Harry. I wonder, do you recognize that? Yes, that is Mr. Stiles himself on what looks like a McDonald's wrapper or something like that. Well, I guess you have to use what's at hand. But just as people have different signatures, different surfaces have different 
spectral signatures. Now, a spectral signature is not time to call Ghostbusters, right? It comes from the word spectrum, EM spectrum. So it's just different wavelengths of light. And just as different people have signatures that make them stand out from each other, different surfaces have spectral signatures that make them stand out from each other. The green line here represents the vegetation. We've looked at that before. But if we come up here and compare the red and the black line. The black line represents cloud. The red line represents snow. And you can see that that line is straight, so it's reflecting all wavelengths of light and it's reflecting a lot of them. So that means that if all the wavelengths of light are being reflected, you mix all of the different um, wavelengths of visible light together and physicists, what do we get? Yeah, we get white light. Why are clouds white? Why is snow white? because of the reflection there. But because they reflect very, very similarly, if you take a satellite image of clouds and of snow, it's very hard to tell the difference if you just look at the visible wavelength of light. But their spectral signatures differ. And especially if we come up here into the shortwave infrared radiation, you can see that the cloud is still reflecting quite a lot of wavelengths of light here. But whenever you come down here, the snow all of a sudden absorbs most of this wavelength of light. Now the physicists are going to have to explain to me why, because I don't know. But I know that, that difference exists. And because of that, when you do a satellite image using this wavelength of light, all of a sudden you can easily tell the difference between snow and cloud. So if you're wanting to look at glacier retreat, ice cap melting, this wavelength of light is extremely useful because it helps you to see it very, very clearly. And those spectral signatures will be something I think we'll be putting to very good use in this. So let's come back to this um, image that we started off with. What can you see here? Those are the active fire fronts. Does it matter that we know where the fire actually is at? Well, yes, especially if we're in some of these very inaccessible areas. You need to know where to send um, those that would be tasked with um, trying to tackle this, or you need to know where the fire is likely to spread next. This is the burnt area. You're going to be looking at the impacts of that. You're going to be trying to assess how much damage has been done. Um, and then this is your aerosol pollution where the smoke is coming. And you can really look then at the air quality and the, the chemist, uh, the chemist I'm sure will add some brilliant stuff here in terms of air quality and what you can measure uh, with regard to the, the pollution that comes from something like this. Okay, so that's a little bit of an introduction to remote sensing itself. But what of the project? What is it that we're proposing? Well, first instance, this is a STEM-based project. It's physics, chemistry, biology, and geography working together. What I'm hoping to do here is to get us engaged in a project that's looking at some aspect of climate change. And the reality of climate change is this. Climate change is such a massive challenge to us, a pressing and difficult thing that we're going to have to face, but it is a huge and broadly spread challenge. Um, physicists need to be involved, chemists, biologists, geographers, and so many others. What we need is a generation of people with deep and profound subject-specific knowledge from whatever subjects you're, you're studying, working together from people from other subjects and other specialities because the breadth of the challenge of this problem is such that we can only solve it by collaborating and working together. And that's why I, I want this to be a stem based project where we are working together to focus on some aspect of climate change. We're targeting this particularly towards sixth formers because we really want you to get your teeth into this. Uh, this is the kind of project that you as sixth formers can really take and run with. You have the maturity and the subject knowledge and the sophistication to do some really interesting, innovative and groundbreaking work here. What I also I think is important in this because we're going to be working with six formers is that we co-design this together. Um, and that counts for the teachers as well. Uh, hopefully you'll see that I have a, a good general idea of where we're going to go with this. But I very much purposely want us to design this together. 
I want you to have ownership of this and I want you to really take the initiative with this and it's going to be an exploration of how we can use remote sensing data to explore some aspect of climate change. It might be wildfires, it might be something else. That's where the co-designing comes in and we're going to do this in near real time. We have a, a massive international climate change conference taking place in Glasgow uh, in the autumn. This is going to be very, very timely uh, and it is very, very important, I think, that we get a chance to explore these issues together. The end focus of this, uh, again, I'm keeping this reasonably open-ended, but it'll be some form of presentation. I've been already in touch with Queen's University in Belfast uh, and they're very interested in the work that we're doing, maybe with them with a company, Esri, that produces a lot of the software technology that we've been using to present these maps to you today. And in fact, the last time I did a project with Esri, uh, we managed to get the pupils, or some of the pupils who were involved in that, an opportunity to present, uh, and that's not just in Northern Ireland, but in front of 19,000 people on a stage in San Diego in California. Now, I can't promise you that our end presentation will be quite as glamorous as that, but I do think this is a great opportunity for us to have some way of pulling this together and showcasing this. What um, about the support that will be in place and, and what are you going to get from this? Um, I'm learning this myself, so I'll certainly be on hand to help and support with it. And we'll be able to bring in the support from some of those other organizations that we've been in contact with. Uh, so this is an opportunity for you, whether you're a teacher watching this, uh, interested in getting involved, or a pupil, to increase your capacity. You'll be supported in this, you'll be trained, uh, and you'll develop and increase your abilities in this area. Your involvement in this will lead, I think, and I hope to a whole bunch of um, personal development in this. You're going to be involved in a very, very innovative project. As far as I'm aware, there are no schools in the UK or Ireland who are doing anything like this at all. This is groundbreaking. It's trailblazing. You're going to be involved in putting together and co-designing a project that no schools have done before. Your own personal development and growth through that will be immense. And in the small matter of the personal statements that are coming up for university, imagine being able to write about your involvement in something like this. And it's also on your own personal development, an opportunity for you to develop your thinking and team working skills. Um, you're bringing your subject specific expertise as a physicist, chemist, biologist or geographer to this. But you're going to be working together. You're going to be drawing on each other's expertise. None of us has sufficient expertise to do this by ourselves. We need to be working together. And this is a microcosm for what we need to be doing in terms of climate change. We will only meet the challenges of climate change as we collaborate and work together. So you're going to really get a chance to develop those skills, which I think are incredibly important. What we need moving into the 21st century is increasingly um, uh, generations of people coming in who have that subject specific expertise, who can bring the keys to unlock that particular area, along with the ability to work with each other, the ability to work outside of your area of expertise, to collaborate, to cooperate, to innovate, to come up with that synergistic ideas together that we couldn't have come up with alone. I'm excited about the fact that I don't know where this project's going to go. I'm excited about the fact that there are areas, aspects of this chemistry, especially that I know very little about. I'm excited that we have to be working together for this. I'm excited, most of all, I think, because what this does is gives an opportunity for you as young people to have your voices amplified. You're the ones in particular going to live with the legacy of the decisions that are made over the next decades. It's more important than ever that you have a chance to make your voice heard. So let's raise our voices together. Let's collaborate. Let's see where this goes. And let's enjoy the ride. Thanks very much for your time. Mm -hmm.